So I didn't have time to talk about this last week, um, but I wanted to address this because it's such a bizarre story and I don't even know how to process this. Like the details surrounding this story are extremely weird and I don't even really have a conclusive thing to say about this other than I'm really disappointed in the outcome and specifically I'm disappointed in several Democratic Party lawmakers, in particular AOC, Jamal Bowman, and Mondaire Jones. So there was a vote on an additional $1 billion in funding for the Iron Dome in Israel, which I would be 100% against because unless we're willing to fund a Palestinian Iron Dome? Why are we funding defenses only for Israel? And furthermore, why aren't they funding their own defenses? They have a universal healthcare system and we don't. They can pay for their own defense, right? So it's just, it's totally unnecessary. It's its virtue signaling. It's stupid. So the vote should obviously have been no. However, AOC voted no. And then she had some sort of a heated exchange with Nancy Pelosi, which we don't necessarily know what was said. But then she changed her vote to present. She was seen crying and being embraced by, I believe, Barbara Lee. And a lot of people, myself included, were perplexed by this. We don't know what happened. Clearly something happened. But AOC tried to provide us with some clarification as to why she voted the way that she did. And she released this unnecessarily long, convoluted statement that left me even more confused than I initially was. And since this is so long... I don't even want to really read this and waste your time on it, but what we're going to do is we're going to read it at double speed. So I'll read all of it, but just much faster than I normally would, thanks to the uh, magic of editing. So here we go. To our New York 14 community, yesterday the House called to the floor a rushed $1 billion supplemental military funding bill for Israel's dome defense system. I want to be clear with our community that I'm opposed to this bill, but ultimately cast the present vote. My job as your representative is to first and foremost serve with transparency and remain accountable to you, the people of New York's 14th Congressional District. First, let me begin with why I believe this bill should have been opposed. Contrary to popular narrative, this bill was not for all U.S. funding of the Iron Dome, and opposing it would not defund U.S. financing of the system in any way, shape, or form. Since 2011, the U.S. has provided $1.7 billion for the Iron Dome and is already financially committed to continuing these funds through 2028. This bill adds an additional $1 billion in funding in one year to the system alone. For context, that is an amount in one year that approaches all the funding to the system we have provided over the last decade. And this is in addition to $3 billion authorized earlier this year and other forms of military funding to the Israeli government. I believe strongly that Congress should take greater scrutiny with all military funding across the world. I also believe that for far too long, the U.S. has handed unconditional aid to the Israeli government while doing nothing to address or raise the persistent human rights abuses against the Palestinian people, and that this imbalance of power must be centered in any honest conversation about Israel and Palestine. In addition to the many other governments we militarily fund with a pattern of human rights abuses, such as the Saudi and Colombia related amendments I introduced last week as well. In addition to opposing the substance of the Iron Dome supplemental bill, the process of bringing it to the House floor was deeply unjust. The legislative language itself was initially introduced earlier this week by way of an attempt to quietly slip this funding into routine legislation without any of the usually necessary committee debate, markup, or regular order. A funding leap this significant is a policy area that is already so charged and fraught for many communities, particularly our own, deserves the respect of a proper legislative process. Unfortunately, that process did not happen, and the reckless decision by House leadership to rush this controversial vote within a matter of hours and without true consideration created a tinderbox of vitriol, disingenuous framing, deeply racist accusations and depictions, and lack of substantive discussion on this matter. I want to be clear that the decision to rush this vote, virtually preventing any member from meaningfully consulting with their community, was both intentional and unnecessary. Even the night before, as it became clear that the discourse around this issue was quickly devolving from substance to hateful targeting, I personally had a call with the House Majority Leader to request a 24-hour stay of the vote so that we could do the work necessary to bring down the temperature and volatility, explain our positions, and engage our communities. That request was summarily dismissed. Not only was the request dismissed, but despite the House having almost eight straight hours of votes yesterday, this vote was chosen to be the first, despite being one of the most controversial. The damage of this careless process created very real spillover effects into our community. It created a real sense of panic and horror among those in our community who otherwise engaged thoughtfully in these discussions and fueled the discussion to devolve to a point where it became clear that this vote would risk a severe devolution of the good faith community fabric that allows us to responsibly join in a struggle for human rights and dignity everywhere, from Palestine to the Bronx and Queens. In short, the rush of this vote into a matter of hours was threatening to tear our community apart and permanently close the doors that we desperately need to open in order to progress. Yes, I wept. I wept at the complete lack of care for the human beings that are impacted by these decisions. I wept at an institution choosing a path of maximum volatility and minimum consideration for its own political convenience. And I wept at the complete lack of regard I often feel our party has to its most vulnerable and endangered members and communities because the death threats and dangerous vitriol we'd inevitably receive by rushing such a sensitive charge and underconsidered vote weren't worth delaying it even for a few hours to help us do the work necessary to open a conversation of understanding. It certainly wasn't the first time people's well-being was tossed aside for political convenience, and sadly, I do not believe it will be the last. To those I have disappointed, I am deeply sorry. To those who believe this reasoning is insufficient or cowardice, I understand. To those who ask me to quell the volatility of this moment in our community, which constituted the majority of constituent feedback our office received, I hope we can take this moment and opportunity to more deeply engage in and grow a true substantive movement of community support for human rights around the world, which includes cherishing and respecting the human rights of Palestinian people. What? <laughs> I'm so confused. I I'm way more confused now than I was before. So she's against the funding for this bill. She doesn't like it. And she supports the Palestinian people and the human rights struggle. But she still voted present. I just don't understand. You voted present because you didn't have an opportunity to consult with your community. I mean, if you already think that this is bad, they already elected you twice now to represent them so just vote no i just i don't understand like the only thing that i can expect or or suspect rather is that she voted no and nancy pelosi badgered her or something like that on the floor 
I mean, it's just it's weird because if Nancy Pelosi were going around trying to whip up votes for this, one, she doesn't necessarily have to do this because it passed handily. And two, you'd expect her to also go to Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar and badger them as well because they voted no as well. So why would she single out AOC? I'm genuinely perplexed here. This doesn't make any sense to me. And, you know, for an issue like this that she claims is controversial, it's not actually controversial. This was voted on overwhelmingly. And when it comes to funding Israel, I'd argue that it's not actually that controversial in the House of Representatives. Most members of Congress overwhelmingly support Israel unconditionally. So it's not controversial. It's only controversial if you don't do what your constituents want. Now, when it comes to the other progressives, I think that they're equally guilty. Jamal Bowman, Mondaire Jones. So I don't want to single AOC out. It's just that I think that she knew that the left would be disappointed in this, and so she chose to put out a response, but the response doesn't really do anything to quell uh, the disappointment that we feel, because the response is nonsensical, in my opinion. It doesn't make any sense. And I just, I mean, if Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib voted no, then why didn't you? That's basically what it comes down to, and the excuses that you're giving us don't make any sense to me, and I don't buy it. So, uh, you know, having said that, though, I'm not going to overly target AOC here. This situation, I mean, it was hopeless, right? Even if AOC, Jamal Bowman, and Mondar Jones did what they should have done and voted no on this, it still would have passed. So there's this broader issue of trying to normalize criticism of Israel, good faith criticism of their abuse of the Palestinian people. But that is really a momentous task. And the reason why I'm so disappointed as a leftist is because progressives in Congress like AOC, they really are the ones who can move the ball, move the needle in a positive direction. What they did over the summer when Israel did their incursion into Gaza once again and were slaughtering children, when AOC, Rashida Tlaib, Cori Bush all on the floor condemned Israel and called it a Palestinian apartheid or and called it a par an apartheid state, that really made a difference that for the first time started to change the mainstream conversation around this issue. So when you do something like this, it just, it is cowardly. That's what it is. It doesn't seem cowardly. It is cowardly, but it's not just AOC. It's Jamal Bowman and Mondaire Jones as well. So, you know, things like this are really, really frustrating to me because you're going to have People on the left who are basically anti-electoral politics, they're going to use this as evidence that electing more progressives is a bad idea because they're just going to dis disappoint you. But contrary to popular belief, I actually think that this should fuel the fight to get more progressives elected as we approach the 2022 primary season, right? Because if you have more progressives, you're just going to increase the odds of them not disappointing you, of them making votes that you agree with. It's just pure math. And most of the time, the squad gets it right, but sometimes they get it wrong. So the more progressives that you have, the more you better your chances at getting votes that we want, having votes go our way or the way that's not as bad as they usually are. So overall, I hope that AOC takes this as a learning opportunity. And what this tells me is that she did anticipate some sort of pushback from the left. And that's why she put out the statement. I mean, I don't believe Jamal Bowman or Mondar Jones put out a statement. So that tells me that they're either they don't know, like they're ignorant to the pushback that they should have expected to receive. Uh, but AOC, by putting out the statement, it kind of tells me that she knew that this was wrong and that she does feel as if she appears to be a coward. And uh, she should, because this was a very disappointing vote. There's no reason to switch your vote from no to present. I mean, it's not like this was the one vote that decided what happened, but what's the point? Like, if you're going to vote present, like, why vote at all? It's such a pointless, meaningless gesture. And when I see a present vote, it just it makes me feel like, oh, well, that's that's a cowardly thing to do. But either way, I'm not going to beat, beat up on AOC too much for this. It's bizarre and weird, but in the future, you can avoid any controversy whatsoever if you just do what you know, what you've proven to know, is the right thing. And this was not the right thing. So AOC, do better.